Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded and we move to questions without notice. Are there any questions? I call the honourable member for Port Adelaide. Blacksland. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Communications, if he's here. I refer to this article in the Australian Financial Review, where the minister confirms that he owns a yacht with the person in charge of the NBN Strategic Review that gets released by the minister tomorrow. My question to the minister, if he was here, is, given this fact, how can we believe anything that this report says? I'll call the honourable the acting Prime Minister. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I am sure that the Minister for Communications will be able to respond very effectively to the matters raised. But what the Labor Party always oh, needs to remember when right. they're talking about the NBN is their failure to deliver on any of the commitments they've made in relation to high-speed broadband in this country. The failure to deliver. There is too much. The, the acting prime minister will take his seat. Uh, the manager of opposition business on the point of order. I appreciate the situation the acting prime minister finds himself in, but if he needs to. The point to, of order is. The point of order is as you used to raise. If he does not the know the answer, he should sit down. The question can be re-asked now that the, the minister has turned up no for work. Point of order. I gathered the question. Not the question. I call the honourable the minister for communications. Madam Speaker, J. B. Rousselot and I are very flattered to learn that the opposition regard our ancient cooter boat as a yacht. It was built in 1923, and it is in fact the same age as my father-in-law. <laughs> who, however, insists that he has more of his original parts than does the boat. Uh, J.B. Rousselot has done an outstanding job in heading the transformation and uh, review uh, at the NBN Co. An outstanding job. And I would have thought, Madam Speaker, that the honourable members opposite had a little bit more class than to sink to the character assassination practiced by the Senator Conroy in the Senate committee. It is a low effort to impugn J.B. Rousselot's ability. He is, unlike Mike Kaiser, who was employed by the Labor Party at the Indian Co., J.B. Rousselot is, in fact, qualified to work at a telco. He's worked in telecommunications for over a decade. He's an engineer. He has a degree, Madam Speaker from one of the oldest engineering schools in the world, founded by the King of France, Louis XVI, the École des Ponts et des Chaussées, which, as uh, Bernie R the Mem Mr Ripple will understand, is on the School left. of Bridges and Roads. So a highly qualified individual, and the best that the Labor the Party can do way. is combine, combine with Senator Conroy in a desperate effort to smear this work that's being done on the strategic review. The member for the work, Isaacs. The work that is the truth, Madam Speaker, is that the Labor Party has misled and spun and deceived on broadband for four years. And they know that there has been an objective review undertaken by Cordamenta, Deloitte, Boston Consulting Group, and leading executives at the NBN Co. And the uh, shadow the, uh, Attorney General doesn't want seat. you to. Uh, the member for Isaacs. Madam Speaker, had you given me the call, I I'm would have given you the call. But what is your point of order? Several seconds after I what stood up. What is your point of order? The member will resume his seat. The minister has the call. Then resume your seat if you can't get on with it. Is about his Member conflict of interest. His seat. The, me the Minister for Communications has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, the tomorrow, tomorrow we will see the truth about the NBN. The Labor Party does not want to hear it. 
They don't want to know how many billions of dollars they've wasted. They don't want to know how many falsehoods they've told. They don't want to know about how distorted a reality they still live in on this great project. The, the truth time will out has expired. I call the honourable member for Reid. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the acting Prime Minister. I refer the Minister to this electricity bill from Mr Brett Macdonald, Managing Director of Homebush Export Meat Company in my electorate, that shows his energy costs rising 6,000 each year as a result of the carbon tax. What is standing in the way of the government keeping its election commitment to abolish the carbon tax and reduce energy prices? I call the Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And this, this, example, this example is just so typical of what's happening to businesses right across the nation. The impact of the carbon tax on their costs is costing jobs, it's costing competitiveness, and it's making Australian industry think twice about whether they can invest in this country. Now, the, the meat processing sector is one of those that's affected perhaps worse than most by the carbon tax because they're hit in so many, many different ways. You know, the carbon tax affects uh, someone like the Homebush Export Meat Company uh, as a result of the carbon tax that they pay on their direct emissions. They pay it on their electricity. They pay carbon tax on their gas. They pay carbon tax on their water. They pay carbon tax on their refrigerants. And of course, if the Labor Party has its way, they'll pay carbon tax also on transport. Now, all of those makes the Homebush Export Meat Company, like all other meat exporters in Australia, just so much less competitive than they otherwise would be. Six thousand dollars on his electricity bill alone, but. I, uh, but he would also be paying very much higher uh, uh, refrigeration costs on his, um, on his refrigeration needs. In fact, the, the unit price for the gas that's used in his refrigerants and his freezers has gone from $129 to $2,492. The unit price from 129 to 249 to 2492 dollars as a direct result of labor's carbon tax now this is the kind of burden that australian meat exporters can ill, in, Ill afford to try and um, uh, address now, the carbon tax will be a hindrance to everyone in business until it goes and unfortunately we've got an opposition that hasn't listened to what the people have said about their, in their judgment on the carbon tax, this tax has to go. We have a mandate from the people to get rid of it. And the Greens and the, the Labor Party have got enough termination notices on their CV as it is as a result of, of this carbon tax without resisting, without resisting the legislation even further. It's time we get on with the task now. Get on with the task now of getting rid of this carbon tax so Australian businesses can be properly competitive. I call the honourable member for Brand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. <coughs> Acting Prime Minister, given that it's the general practice of Prime Ministers to have and to publish a code of conduct for ministers and members of the parliamentary executive, is it the intention of the government to have a code of conduct? And when will it be published? I call the acting prime minister. Madam Speaker, I expect to table the code of conduct uh, at the conclusion of question time, and it'll be available on the uh, prime minister and cabinet's website. I call the honourable member for Hinkler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the treasurer. Will the treasurer outline the impact of the carbon tax on electricity prices of Queensland families and businesses? What are the impediments? to removing the impact of the carbon tax. I call the honourable the treasurer. I thank the uh, member for Hinkler for his uh, second question to me this, this week. Uh, and he recognises how important it is for the parliament to repeal the carbon tax legislation, to get rid of the carbon tax, and how important it is for Queensland families and Queensland small businesses because the carbon tax increases the cost of everything, and particularly it increases the cost of doing business in Queensland. 
Uh, now, over the last two years, the average Queensland family has paid more than $300 in carbon tax on their electricity bills. And with the carbon tax removal, the typical Queensland household would save $116 next year. The average family of four would save $174, and that would go up to $240 with the abolition of the carbon tax on just their electricity bills next year. Of course, on average, Australian families would be $550 better off next year with the abolition of the carbon tax. So why is the Labor Party blocking this? The Labor Party said they wanted to terminate the carbon tax. The legislation is now in the Senate and the Labor Party is opposing their own policy to terminate the carbon tax. For a typical Queensland uh, small business, they would save $152 next year in electricity prices if they got rid of the carbon tax, if they didn't have that burden on their business. And that's just electricity. Of course, it flows through to every part of the business. It can flow through, for example, for uh, operators on the Barrier Reef. It flows through to their, their cost of fuel for the boats. Uh, and it flows through in tourism to the electricity bills in hotels, which then flows through to every hotel bill. So I would just say to the Labor Party, if you care about economic growth, the best thing you could possibly do at this moment is support the repeal of the carbon tax. Because getting rid of the carbon tax, according to Treasury's own modelling, will improve economic growth. So if you want to grow the economy, get rid of the carbon tax. If you want to help families, get rid of the carbon tax. If you want to help small businesses, get rid of the carbon tax. And surely, surely, as we approach the release of the mid-year budget next week, surely the Labor Party will come to realise the best thing they could do for Australians is get rid of the carbon tax. I call the Hon. the Deputy, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Um, Acting Prime Minister Holden has just now announced that it will close its doors in 2017. Shame. Shame. What happens to Holden workers now and others in the car industry? Be quiet. I call the Hon. the Acting Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, um, about 10 minutes before question time, I spoke with the uh, general manager of, um, of General Motors in Australia, Mike Devereaux, and he informed me of the company's decision uh, made in Detroit uh, that they would uh, be closing their <coughs> operation or a significant part of their operation in Australia and New Zealand uh, by the end of 2017. I did not speak about it earlier in the House because uh, Mr Devereaux is at this moment addressing his employees and I felt that the employees had a right to hear it from their own management rather than uh, through the media or reporting of question time. But naturally, uh, uh, Ms. Madam Speaker, like all members in the House, we, we regret the fact that GM is to phase down its operations in this country. Holden has been an iconic national brand for Australians, a part of our heritage. It's meant a great deal to Australians be, uh, over several generations. This is important Many issue. of us have had the, the, the pleasure and of, of, of travelling and, and owning Australian-built Holdens, and uh, it is a pity that that will not continue into the future. Now, this government has had indicated right from the very beginning that we wanted Holden to remain manufacturing cars in Australia. We've wanted, we, wanted, we, want to have, we want to have a strong and active motor vehicle manufacturing industry in Australia. We, we unlike Labor, do, do not believe that manufacturing ought to be yesterday's industry in this country. We want, in fact, to see a manufacturing sector that's strong and vibrant, able to stand on its own feet and Melbourne to make significant Ports. contributions to Australia. That's part of the Member reason why we acted to get rid of the fringe benefits tax impost that Labor had imposed, why we want to get rid of the carbon tax now so that car making can be, can, can be more competitive in this country. We are, though, on this day, on this day, most concerned about the capacity of those who have been working in this industry 
some 1,600 uh, at the Elizabeth Vehicle Manufacturing Plant and 1,300 from the Holden Victorias plant, who will, who will no longer be employed by that company sometime between now and 2017. The government stands ready to work constructively with General Motors to, to, to support these people through this difficult time. We will do what we can with General Motors to achieve the very best possible outcomes for these people. Holden will still have a significant presence in Australia, and we want to make sure that their dealers and their employees are supported through this transition. But this is a difficult day for Australians, a difficult day particularly for the Holden employees, and we will stand with them to work constructively to make sure that they can transition into good jobs the in other parts Congress. of our industry. I call the member for Denison. There's too much no the member for Denison has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister responsible for emergency management. Minister, every year Australian governments spend a fortune leasing foreign firefighting aircraft like the acclaimed Ericsson Aircrane. Minister, why don't we establish our own firefighting air force of large specialised aircraft? The Defence Force, for, in for instance, operates hundreds of aircraft, many of which never see operational service. Imagine the good a dozen or so large specialised firefighting aircraft would do. They could even be profitable by helping other countries in the northern summer. Um, the uh, member asked the question of the minister responsible for emergency management. Uh, that is not the name of the minister's title, but the Minister for Justice has responsibility in that area. So perhaps you might like to address your question to the Minister for Justice. Oh, my apologies, Madam Speaker. I, I, uh, I did say the minister responsible. No, uh, you asked the minister who's prop by his proper title. All right, well, if I could direct that question to the Minister for Justice, please, I call Madam the Speaker. Honourable the Minister for Justice. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Denison for that question. And it is a good question, uh, and I acknowledge that uh, his home state has been subject to very serious bushfires as recently as this year. Uh, and one capability we do have in Australia to address um, what is always an ever-present danger uh, is firefighting aircraft, and they remain a very important tool for us. Uh, and we do know a lot about this. We've been using firefighting aircraft in Australia since the 1920s, and we've been using water bombing aircraft since the 1960s. And the consensus amongst the experts is that we do get better bang for our buck by leasing those aircraft. Um, and uh, that does allow us the flexibility to take advantage of emerging technologies as well. Uh, currently in Australia we do have a very significant fleet uh, and it covers what of course is a vast geographical area and it includes such things as the member's question said as the Ericsson Sky Cranes which are better known as uh, Elvis even though there's quite a few of them uh, and another of uh, uh, heavy lift helicopters as well as surveillance and intelligence gathering aircraft which assist us with hazard mapping. Uh, leasing aircraft does allow us to acquire more aircraft uh, and expert crew for our summer season, and purchasing a standing fleet of aircraft would be incredibly expensive uh, and not considered to be good value for money um, because of the extensive costs associated with uh, maintaining that fleet of fixed-wing aircraft uh, and also maintaining and supporting pilots, engineers uh, and specialist support crew. Uh, we do have a very significant capability. Uh, we, wor uh, we work at it in conjunction with our state and territory colleagues through the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. Uh, and this centre does lease specialist aircraft for us uh, and brings them to Australia for our summer season. And the Commonwealth Government contributes about $14 million per year uh, for that capability, and states and territories um, also contribute uh, a similar sort of amount. And if I could just to help the member for Denison to highlight the costs of fixed-wing aircraft, for example. Um, a lot of this is commercial in confidence, but to purchase one Canadian fixed-wing aircraft uh, would cost us about $40 million. And you can understand that the numbers of aircraft that are deployed to deal with emergency situations uh, can be quite significant. In New South Wales, during the uh, recent bushfire emergency about six weeks ago, uh, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service deployed about 90 aircraft. Um, to deal with that height of that emergency. So you can understand um, that maintaining a fixed fleet 
um, to deal with that large volume of aircraft would be incredibly expensive, uh, and it's not considered to be good value for money. Uh, and the other point I just might make is that we have looked at using larger fixed-wing aircraft um, for this sort of work. Uh, we've trialled uh, RAF C-130s uh, and also more recently a DC-10, um, but the uh, expert consensus still remains um, that because it's very difficult for those larger fixed-wing aircraft to operate uh, in what can be um, you know, dif difficult geographic locations. I call the honourable member for right. Here, here, here. Here, here. I thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry. I refer to the Minister to this article in today's Courier Mail, mail titled Queensland Households to Cop Shock $270 Power Bill Whack. Will the minister outline the House what impact various policies, including the carbon tax, will have on this surge in power prices facing the Queensland people and the electorate of right? There's too much noise. I call the honourable member, Minister for Industry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and can I thank the member for right for his question and uh, congratulate him on Chifley. what a fantastic job he does. And the member for he is Adelaide. my neighbour, so I guess I'm a bit biased. But but uh, the member for Wright does a fantastic job in his electorate. Not only did he have a very difficult start in that electorate because of the floods, but he's gone on to make sure that that is there for every issue that the people in his community face. And, Madam Speaker, the issue that his community is facing at the moment is a cost of living pressure coming from the carbon tax. And, and we didn't need this report today in the Courier Mail to know that electricity prices are going up because of the carbon tax. But but, Madam Speaker, this, this, uh, this report today in the Courier Mail highlights the fact that Queenslanders can expect an increase in their power bill of $270 per annum. Now, the member for Watson. The member for Watson. And the member for Madam Morton Speaker, will I, I, I don't mind taking that interjection because if anyone's out of touch, it's those who sit on the other side. How out of touch can you be? How out of touch can you be when families are facing power increases and the, and the Queensland Competition Authority says that without the carbon tax, without the carbon tax, the increase will be more than halved. How out of touch can you be when faced with those statistics that you the continue to support a tax on households when the people of Australia have given those on this side of the chamber a mandate to remove the tax. So this side is so far out of touch, they do not know the pain that families are going through at the moment in relation to increased electricity prices. Now, Madam Speaker, the figures the released today Martin by the Competition Authority show that by removing the carbon tax, it would cut the increase in tariff 11 prices from 13.6 per cent to 5.4 per cent. Madam Speaker, more than half. Halving the increase is something that's important to every Queenslander. And Madam Speaker, of course, it doesn't just relate to Queenslanders. It relates to every household and every business in Australia. Every household and every business in Australia is being choked by this carbon tax. We want to start 2014 with some momentum in business. We want to start the year with some confidence. We need to get rid of this carbon tax. We need to make sure that households can the see an end to the tyranny that the Labor Party imposed on them through higher taxes, higher carbon taxes and higher electricity prices. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker the people who sit opposite are committing Queenslanders and all Australians Jagger, Jagger. to higher electricity prices. I call the honourable call the honourable member for Wakefield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Industry. And I refer to the Victorian Liberal Government yesterday joining the South Australian Government in calling for the federal government to return the five hundred million it had cut from Ordoa Systems. Given Holden's announcement today, why was this government so complacent about Australian jobs? I call the Honourable Minister for Industry. Well, thank, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And how quickly do they degenerate to raw politics when the, when the, when the, 
when the workers of the Holden factory are going through there is too an extraordinary much noise traumatic on my left. and an extraordinarily traumatic time, not one word of the sympathy members for those who sit and Adelaide not one will word of will cooperate with what this government puts in place to ensure the industry and economic diversity of Adelaide is is continued. Not one word, not one word, straight to the, the politics. The problem that they created, they created. Madam Speaker, they were the ones who were in power for the last six years. They the are the ones who oversaw the, the, the industry lose two manufacturers, assist. half the manufacturing capacity. And Madam Speaker, they are the ones who laid the foundation for this closure. They are the ones, they are the ones who failed to address the fundamental economic issues that are affecting Holden. They are the ones who wouldn't even, would not even revoke the carbon tax to try and help Holden. Would not even be part of that. But Madam Speaker, I'm I'm asked specifically about cuts in funding. And it brings me to mind, brings me to mind if I could get a word the in The Member for Melbourne Ports brings... is warned. Excellent. The Minister has the call. You're in a straight and you're a hypocrite. Keep you're going. Are you going to warn him, Madam Speaker? I don't <laughs> warn him. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, those who interject the loudest have the most have the most impact on this decision. They are the ones who are in government for six years. And let me just let me just outline the to the House for their benefit. Kingsford and that the member when for I left Adelaide this portfolio, there were there were three hundred and thirty five thousand cars being made in Australia. And when I resumed it after the Labor Party, that number had lost it dropped to two hundred and twenty one thousand. Madam Speaker, they continue to interject, but I'm going to keep going. The reality is the number of businesses the member involved had dropped from desist. 200 to 150 under their watch. Under their watch. And the amount of money taken the out of the car schemes was $1.23 billion by the Labor Party. Two tranches of $400 million out of the, uh, out of the, cleaner, uh, out of the green car fund. And then finally the coup de grace of $430 million out of the cleaner, uh, cleaner car rebate scheme. $1.23 billion taken out by that government. And of course, Madam Speaker, we know just to finish, just to finish the industry off, they introduced a $1.8 billion fringe benefits tax, which drove sales, including the Holmes, for through the floor. They warm. are hypocrites, Madam Speaker. They did nothing for six years, and now they want to politicise the pain of the workers who have suffered today. Before I call the member for Hindmarsh to ask his question. We are clearly dealing with some serious issues today and the chamber would be well served if we could have some more silence and hear answers as well as questions. I call the honourable member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to the announcement by General Motors in Detroit today regarding their Australian operations. What is the Treasurer's the silence, response? Member for Isaacs. I call the honourable the treasurer. I thank the honourable member for Jagger Jagger. The member for Jagger Jagger is warned. I thank the honourable member for Hindmarsh uh, for his question. The uh, member for Isaacs that, is warned. Now that uh, now that Mike Devereux has had time to speak to his workers, it the is appropriate for, for us. Is warned. Obviously, they're not taking it too seriously, Madam Speaker. Now that Mike Devereaux has had the chance to speak to his own workers, uh, I want to provide the. The member for Isaacs will remove himself under 94A. The Treasurer has the call. You know, there wasn't that outrage around when under Labor Mitsubishi left and Ford left. Where was that outrage? Where was that outrage from Labor? What a surprise. And Ford, and Ford left and Mitsubishi Ford. left and Labor wasn't too outraged then. We are the ones, we are the ones that are, Mr Speaker, Madam Speaker, concerned about the workers at not only Holden, but the all of the components the manufacturers the associated. His seat. The Treasurer will resume his seat. There is a general warning for all those sitting on my left. 
This is a serious issue, as I said before. The questions are important and the answers are important. The Treasurer has the call. I call the uh, member for Grainler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just on the contradiction between a general warning, which by definition applies to every member of the House, and I the said, fact that you left. said that that is my point of order. <clears throat> it is not possible to have a general warning to just one side of the House, Madam Speaker. Uh, then I'll name you one by one if I have to. I'll call the Treasurer. Now that now that Mr Devereux has Member for Jagger Jagger has already had a warning. If she wishes to leave under 94A, that's just fine. The, clock. the Treasurer has the call. Now that Mr Devereux has had the opportunity to speak to his workers, I want to say on behalf of the government, together with the Minister for Industry, the Acting Prime Minister, uh, the Member for Sturt and all members, that we will work closely with the government of South Australia and the opposition in South Australia the unions and all of the stakeholders to ensure that the, uh, that the fact that Holden are leaving in 2017 does not lead to a significant economic downturn in South Australia or Victoria. We will do everything we can to assist during this transition. Madam Speaker. This is hugely important, and we will do that because it is not a surprise that this should have happened. Uh, the members know it's not a surprise, and why? As was revealed in an OECD report to the member for Lilly in 2012, 2012, when his own former chief of staff was at the OECD, they recommended, as underlined by the authorities, there is a case for help to smooth the transition but not preventing it when its pace and scale make it difficult to absorb, for instance at the regional level, in relation to the closure of car plants in Australia. Now, the facts are that the car industry in Australia has had enormous financial support from taxpayers. And during the period of time, during the period of time when there has been a significant reduction uh, in activity in Australia, the government, whether it's Labor or Liberal, has provided enormous financial support, over a billion dollars a year. But the net result is we've seen a halving in the production of Australian cars on a world scale. And these are the things that we have to deal with the in order to Treasurer's address some of the challenges for Holden. Time has expired. I call the honourable the deputy leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the acting prime minister. I refer the acting prime minister to his letter to Holden yesterday, and Holden's reaction to that letter. Uh, and I quote. Uh, the letter was designed for political consumption rather than being a genuine effort to communicate. Hasn't the government got exactly what it wanted, and won't Australia's workers pay for their failure? Uh, before, 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 I call, before I call the Honourable the Treasurer to answer that question, or the Acting Prime Minister, I beg your pardon, uh, in order for a quote to be used, I would remind the Deputy Leader that you have to say from where the quote comes and show why it is relevant to the question. It, the quote had no source, so uh, the question can't stand. Does the, does, can the Deputy Leader rephrase her question? I, I can table the source. No, I don't wish you to table. I can, I I can, you to table, I can table the source. I, there will be silence. I said to the deputy leader, she can have the opportunity to rephrase her question and give the source in her question, as is the proper way to do it. I, I, can, I can verify the source. Re it comes from question the Australian it. Financial Review. Hockey dares GM to leave. Yeah. That is not what that. I asked you, deputy leader. Deputy leader, I'll give one more chance. I said rephrase your question and give the source of the quote. In the Madam, question. I call the deputy Madam, leader. Madam Speaker, I re my question is to the acting prime minister. I refer the acting prime minister to this article in the Australian Financial Review, which says that his letter to Holden, and I quote, was designed for political consumption rather than being about? a genuine effort to communicate. Look, hasn't the article got exactly? Hasn't the government got exactly what it wanted? And won't Australian workers pay for their failure? I call the Leader of the House. Well, Madam Speaker, on two points the question doesn't stand. In spite of you giving the Acting Leader of the Opposition an opportunity to 
rephrase her question. She still has failed to uh, uh, state the source, who she is quoting. The, po the point of order is that the question is out of order. The second aspect of reason it's out of order is the last part of the question was entirely hypothetical. It was argument, not a question, and therefore it can't stand. And the, the managing opposition business needs to get the questions right rather than simply expect you to put up with questions that don't fit the standing orders. I would say uh, the manager of opposition business. To the, point of, to the point of order, Madam Speaker, the verification that was provided refers to the Holden spokesperson making that comment and making that quote. And it was worded that way in the first instance. You then asked for it to be reworded no, with the verification and was then, done so. The, in terms uh, of the second half of the question, which has also been an issue, the entirety of question time yesterday, we saw the Treasurer daring the company to leave, and we are entitled to put uh, that back to them. <laughs> that is uh, not a point of order. That is going to argument. I simply said in the first place that the question to be in order, where you use a quote, must give the source of the quote, which shows why it is relevant to the question. And that was not in the original question. So perhaps the deputy leader can have a last try. Madam, Madam Speaker, my question is to the acting prime minister, and I refer him to an article uh, on the Australian Financial Review website, which says, and I quote in the article, a Holden spokesman said the company would not respond to Mr Truss's letter, which it felt was designed for political consumption rather than being a genuine effort to communicate. Haven't you got what you wanted? I, I would suggest I'm going to let the question stand and call the acting prime minister, but I would, I would make this point that the standing order requires a quote to have a proper source and a Holton spokesman is getting very, very close to the line. However, I will allow the question to stand, and I call the acting Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And obviously, I, I, I'm not competent to, cope on, uh, to, comment, to comment on uh, the uh, statements of a Holton spokesman. That's a matter for them. The member for McMahon uh, has been warned he will leave under 94A. Yeah. I did indicate um, yesterday that I thought it was important for Holden to make its position clear so that Australians knew whether it intended to keep manufacturing in this country or not. Holden have, undertaken, have made that statement now, and whilst I regret the nature of the statement and the fact that Holden is, is to downsize its uh, operations in Australia, they have at least delivered certainty to the Australian marketplace and, in particular, certainty to their employees. Holden will continue to have a large number of employees in Australia, and, but the some will no longer will be needed because of the closure of their manufacturing operations. <laughs> This downsizing is going to occur over a period of four years, and for that reason, we as a government will stand ready to work with them the to work with them to try and the make 98. this transition as smooth as possible. Madam Speaker, there is one other thing I would like to convey to the House from my discussions uh, with Mr. Devereux. He said that in his statements he would not be seeking to blame governments, either state or federal, That's right. from the, for the decision that Detroit has made. They have, they have to use his words, uh, confronted a perfect storm of events which are affecting their decisions about their future as a company, not just in Australia but in other parts of the world. Now, the reality is that there are a number of things that have happened uh, over, a, over a number of years which have made vehicle manufacturing in Australia less competitive than it once was. Less competitive than it once was. It's self-evident to us all that wages paid in Australia are much higher than wages in other parts of the world. Costs in Australia are much higher than other parts of the world. On the other hand, this is a country with a skilled workforce and, and the natural advantages of working in an environment where there can be a supportive community and people live in a, in a pleasant lifestyle. 
The member now, this for Parramatta will remove herself to under 94A. With the motor vehicle industry to make its environment as, as satisfactory as possible so that they can manufacture and, and do so in a profitable way. Now, I'm not going to take this opportunity again to re refer to what that happened over the last few terms of government. The reality is we must face the situation as it is now and get on with helping the Holden workers to make a transition and the economy of South Australia to move into new areas uh, where it can prosper and provide work for, for, for its people. Before I call the honourable member for Macquarie, I would advise the House that we have uh, in the gallery the former member for Barker, uh, Mr Secker, the former, member, the former Western Australia Senator, Ross Lightfoot, and a ministerial delegation of the Government of Papua New Guinea, whom we particularly welcome. We also have present former Victorian Senator Kay Patterson, and we have the APEC 7th delegation from the Philippines. All of those people are very, made very welcome here today. I call the honourable member for Macquarie. I thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline the challenges the government faces in managing the Commonwealth's budget? What are the impediments to addressing the situation the government inherited? I call the honourable the Treasurer. I thank the member for Macquarie for her question. And the challenges we face in relation to the budget are obvious given the fact that we now have $20 billion of savings. $5 billion of the $20 billion was actually announced by Labor that are held up and blocked in the Senate by the Labor Party and the Greens. And of course, the Australian economy is facing challenges. That's what we have inherited from Labor. And the challenges identified by the general manager, the GM of Chairman and CEO Dan Ackerson today in Detroit, are the same challenges that many other manufacturers and businesses in Australia are facing. And I quote, and this is the CEO of Holden, of General Motors Holden in Detroit, and he says, the decision to end manufacturing in Australia reflects the perfect storm of negative influences the automotive industry faces in the country, including the sustained strength of the Australian dollar, high cost of production, small domestic market, and arguably the most competitive and fragmented auto market in the world. He says that, and he's right. It is a challenging market in which to operate, and it is a market that has been heavily subsidised by Australian governments. In the case of Holden, $1.8 billion between 2001 and 2012. But if money were the issue why Holden was, is leaving Australia, then why did Ford leave and Mitsubishi leave whilst Labor was in government? The money was flowing, but they decided to leave. One of the things that needs to be noted is the, the high for cost of production. The for and I say resist. emphatically to the workers at Toyota, who are due to make a decision this Friday about a proposal put to them by the management of Toyota, I say to them emphatically, please vote for your jobs this Friday. The ANWU is recommending a vote against a proposal put forward by Toyota to try and have a fairer arrangement in the workplace. For example, for example Toyota exports 70 per cent of its produce to the Middle East. At the moment, Toyota has to close its plant for 21 days over Christmas. How does that work? when you're trying to export to the Middle East where they don't celebrate Christmas. And now Toyota has gone back to the workers and said, please reduce this to 10 days so that we can have consistent supply. And the AMWU is recommending a vote against it. The AMWU wouldn't even meet with the Toyota management because the AMWU wanted to have 53 people turn up gone. to a meeting with Toyota management the for in order to negotiate the deal. So the destiny of other manufacturers in Australia is inevitably in all the hands of all the stakeholders, including in particular the union leaders. I call the honourable member for Gorton. Thanks, thanks very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Employment. Can the minister advise what assistance will be made available to workers who lose their jobs as a result of the government leaving Holden with no choice but to leave Australia? I call the Honourable the Assistant Minister for Employment. 
Look, and I thank I thank the member for his question. And this is a very important issue that uh, confronts us, ensuring that we have competitive industries in this country. Absolutely. And it seems passing strange that the member can feign support for these workers at a time when they're standing in the way of this government making Australia a more competitive place. Making Australia a more competitive place because that is the key. That is the key. That is the key to ensuring the future of jobs, is ensuring that we have a competitive economy that is in fact operating at a world class level. So rather than the assistance of the members opposite, we have we have the gaggle opposite just standing there and, and moaning rather than getting behind the abolition of the carbon tax, the abolition of the mining tax and this government improving the efficiency of this economy. But with regard to the matters that the member raises specifically, I would say that any worker made redundant in the automotive manufacturing industry will receive immediate access to intensive employment assistance support through the Automotive Industry Structural Adjustment Program. This program is delivered by Job Services Australia and uh, provides uh, support for job seekers at a stream three level. So that is support. But the best way, the best way we can ensure the future of these workers is to make the Australian economy as competitive as it can be. So it's about time the members opposite got out of the way of this government and allowed us to make Australia the efficient economy that it should be. I call the honourable member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, representing the Minister for Employment. What will the impact of General Motors' decision in Detroit be to close their operations in Australia by 2017 on employment? I call the Honourable Minister for Education, representing the Minister for Employment. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I uh, thank the member for Hindmarsh for his question. As the senior South Australian in the uh, Parliament uh, and as the Minister for Education, representing the Minister for Employment, can I say that it is a very sad day for South Australia uh, that this announcement has been made by Detroit, uh, by General Motors in Detroit. Nobody should be making light or politics about this decision. This is a decision, Madam Speaker, that affects thousands and thousands of South Australians and Victorians. What was that? And it is a tragic situation but Australia is in the position that it is in as the kind of country that makes it very difficult, very difficult to manufacture such high-end products as motor vehicles because of our uh, labour costs, because of the uh, way that we do business in this country, because of our high Australian dollar, because of our lack of export markets, particularly for Holden, because of decisions that have been made beyond our shores that we've had very little, if any, control over. And South Australians have been well aware of this for a long time. South Australians understand how important the car industry is to our state, but they also understand how fragile it has been for a very long time. And this government, as the previous government did, tried to keep those operations in South Australia and Victoria because we always put people first. Never ideology, always people. And the Deputy Prime Minister has outlined very well the difficulties that Holden, as other car manufacturers, have faced. Mitsubishi faced these difficulties, and Mitsubishi closed. It doesn't matter on whose watch it closed. Mitsubishi closed. The member Ford for faced these is problems, warned. and Ford closed. The member Again, for it doesn't matter on whose warned. watch Ford closed. Ford closed. And Holden is closing in 2017. So this is not a day. The for member for Coria will remove himself scoring. on the 94A, as will the member for Adelaide. Scoring. It is a day to think about the workers and families in South Australia and Melbourne who will be affected by this decision. And this government stands ready to do everything in its power to support the employment of workers in Victoria and South Australia. We will announce over coming years, uh, coming months and years, ways to ensure that we can, well, that's right, because it's closing in 2017, ways to support the workers and their families in South Australia. And I just quote the statement. The decision to end manufacturing in Australia reflects the perfect storm of negative influences the automotive industry faces in the country, including the sustained strength of the Australian dollar, high cost of production, 
small domestic market and arguably the most competitive and fragmented auto market in the world. I call the honourable member for Gorton. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer to Holden's announcement today that uh, it will discontinue vehicle manufacturing in Australia by the end of 2017. What does the Acting PM say to the 1,600 Holden workers in South Australia and 1,300 workers in Victoria who will lose their jobs as a result of the government's complacency and workers in the auto industry across Australia whose jobs, of course, are now in jeopardy? I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, that question is entirely out of order. It makes insinuations about the thinking of the government. It is full of argument. It's hypothetical. And the, the opposition must try and get their questions within the standing orders. On the manager, manager of opposition business. The matters raised in that question, Madam Speaker, are a direct reflection of what happened in question time yesterday. That is not a, that is not a standing order, proper standing order, point of order. Um, the question is asked by the member for Gorton. I'll give him the opportunity to rephrase it, and he will leave out the argumentative part of it. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm happy to rephrase the question. I uh, direct the question, of course, to the Acting Prime Minister, and I refer to the uh, announcement by Holden today that it will be discontinuing vehicle manufacturing in Australia by 2017. Uh, what does the Acting Prime Minister say to the 1,600 Holden workers uh, in South Australia and the 1,300 workers in Victoria who will lose their jobs as a result? of the government's inaction then, to deal with this very important issue. I'll call the Acting Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the question indeed contains a great deal of argument which I would dispute. The reality is that this government has taken substantial steps in the short time it's been in office to actually improve the environment for the manufacturing industry in Australia, and in particular, and in particular for the car manufacturing sector. And unfortunately, I have to report to the House, as is well known to everybody who has been observing what has happened in the parliament over the last uh, few weeks, the opposition, who are today feigning concern about the, the, the fate of the industry. Uh, uh, the, minister, the acting prime minister resume his seat. The deputy leader of the opposition. Madam Speaker, I take of order. deep personal offence at the I'm suggestion. Sorry, there is no point of order. The deputy, leader will resume her seat. the deputy leader will resume her seat. I said the deputy leader will resume her seat. There is no point of order. The acting prime minister. Point of order, Madam Speaker. The manager of opposition business. Understanding order 90. A deeply serious reflection has just been made on members. It should be I, withdrawn. The member will resume his seat. Yesterday I ruled on that point of order. The ruling is the same, that if there is a particular a reflection on a particular member, then the standing order is infringed. If it is general, it is not. That is a consistent ruling in this place. That so long as they are offending more than one of us at a time, it's that is okay. A constant ruling is made in this place. I call the acting prime minister. Madam Speaker, I don't wish to in any way downplay the concern that members opposite feel on on this occasion. But please don't impugn our motives either. Please don't impugn our motives. Absolutely. We have worked constructively to try and provide a better environment for the car industry in this country. And we have, we, 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 you have had the opportunity to indicate support to, to take a significant cost, around $400 a vehicle, off that industry by supporting us in our endeavours to get rid of the carbon tax. You would not have imposed, uh, uh, you would not have sought to put a, a significant tax on fringe benefits had, had, it, the had you been Prime really Minister concerned will resume about his seat, the, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. The, the Acting Prime Minister continues to use a figure that is wrong. That he is knows not a point wrong. of order. It is an argument, and that is in the wrong place. I call the Acting Prime Minister. So uh, I take, I, I, I take uh, offence at the way in which the opposition is seeking to impugn some kind of ill intent on this side towards the car industry, which we as Australians admire. We as Australians have worked together. To try and are determined to do what we can to make it a better industry the, uh, for our nation as a whole. The acting prime minister will resume his seat. Point of order. 
the following motion. I seek I'm leave sorry, to move the following motion. I'm sorry, you can't do it while he's on his feet. I can, I can seek leave to move the following motion. I am seeking leave. And, and the motion is, and uh, I, can I quote? You can only rise on a point of order while the minister well, I can, is speaking. I'm seeking leave to move the following. Yes, you can do that. You've done that. You did it. You did it. You did it, Chris. You've always done it. I'll hear the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, we perfectly understand if the opposition want to move a motion or seek leave, but the correct course in which to do so is that between two items of business. Correct. And if they would read the standing orders, they would know that and they could calm down. When the Prime Minister, acting Prime Minister resumes his seat, then they would be entitled to seek the call. Uh, the manager of opposition business to the point of order. There are a number of occasions, and I have raised them previously directly with you, when the Leader of the House has risen, claiming it was a point of order, and then moved that the member be no longer heard. I've raised it with you, and you've told me that it was in order. Uh, the Leader of the House on the point of order. The on the point of order, order Madam Speaker. Moving that a member be no longer heard is a procedural resolution that can be moved at any time. Seeking leave to move a motion is not a procedural me motion and therefore has to be between two items of business. Uh, the Leader of the House is correct. The member for Gorton will resume his seat. The member for Gorton will resume his seat. The member for Gorton will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. Now, the acting Prime Minister was still continuing his answer. He has the call. Madam Speaker, in addition to the matters and the, the, the initiatives that I've mentioned earlier, let us never forget that there is still uh, uh, more than $1 billion in the automotive transformation scheme which has not been allocated. So there is significant funding there still available to assist the automotive industry in this country. So suggestions that reductions of 500 million, whatever it might be, at some stage in the future, have made, an, have made an, any impact in relation to the industry at this time is clearly a nonsense. There is there is substantial funding still available. Now, the, 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 it may be forgotten that the original question was actually about the welfare of the workers, and let me assure you that we share those concerns. And as I said earlier. We're, we're, we'll be working with the South Australian government, the industry itself and all other interested parties to try and find new workplace opportunities. And we, we call on the, on the opposition to work with us constructively to create the kind of environment in this country which encourages manufacturers and supports those who invest in this country. Now the member for Gorton has the call. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I move that so much of standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the honourable member for Gorton from moving the following motion forthwith. This House condemns the Abbott government for its failure to protect Australian jobs in the automotive and manufacturing yeah. sector. Madam, Spe Madam Speaker, this is indeed a very, very sad day for Australia. An icon, an iconic, an iconic company uh, that has, of course, had a remarkable history doesn't look like it's got much of a future. And we have to ask ourselves, Madam Speaker, why is it that this great company, Holden, sees itself in such a difficult situation? Well, Madam Speaker, you need not go any further than look at the conduct and behaviour of those opposite in terms of not engaging with this company and looking after the 1,300 workers in Victoria and the 1,600 workers and their families in South Australia. Madam Speaker, yesterday, yesterday we had the remarkable situation, the remarkable situation that the treasurer of this country, the treasurer of this country, dared, threatened the company and dared them to leave Australia. Hockey dares GM to leave. Well, guess what, Madam Speaker? Guess what, Madam Speaker? Guess and what, Madam they, Speaker? The treasurer got and his wish. They be seen the again, treasurer the got his will wish. Be Madam Speaker, the Treasurer got his wish because, unfortunately and tragically, as a result of the in lack of engagement, uh, the member lack of regard— his seat, uh, the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, if the member for Gorton seeks leave to move the motion, leave will be granted, and the Manager of Opposition Business and I have agreed that if, uh, if he pursues that course, there will be two speakers per side from the government and the opposition. Is the member for Gordon prepared to move that way? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Uh, in that case, Madam the member Speaker, for Gordon, I'm happy to move the motion. The member for Gordon has the call to move his I, motion. I seek leave to. But he I does not have the call to flash 
any newspapers. Uh, well, and if I he does, he'll be asked to remove himself from the chamber. I seek leave to move the following motion, Madam Speaker, a very serious motion. Uh, that is that this House condemns the Abbott he, he government has leave. for its failure to protect Australian jobs in the automotive and manufacturing sector. Madam Speaker, this motion, this motion needs, to be, needs to be debated in this House because what we have seen today, what we have seen today is, a, is a very difficult and terrible decision for 3,000 workers in this country. And not only those 3,000 workers, Madam Speaker, but what we've seen and what we will see as a result of the decision by Holden today is the multiplying effect of job losses throughout the sector, throughout the automotive sector and indeed other sectors of our economy. And what we have also seen, not only today, but as a result of the inaction by the government this week, is a government that is not interested to ensure an iconic company like Holden stays in this country. And that is an absolute shame, Madam Speaker, an absolute shame. Yesterday, yesterday in this place, we saw the Treasurer stand up and effectively goad, the, goad General Motors Holden to leave Australia. He effectively said, if you don't make a decision, then you might as well get out. That was the, that was the impact and the import of what he, said, what he said yesterday in this place. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately for that company, Unfortunately for those workers and their families, the Treasurer has, has, had his way, has had his way. What we've also seen, of course, before the decision that was taken today, and well before, of course, even the comments made by the Treasurer yesterday, is an internal fight going on within the government about how they can stop taxpayers' money in any way providing support for this important sector of our economy. What we have seen is instead of them using their energy and their industry to support these workers and that company, what we have seen instead is them fighting each other to see if they can drag this company out of this country. And that itself, they should hold their heads in collective shame about that inability to look after Holden, Madam Speaker. What we, of course, as a result, as a result, as a result, almost 3,000 workers in this country go to Christmas. Uh, go to Christmas uh, with great uncertainty. There is nothing worse for a family than not having secure employment, Madam Speaker. There is nothing worse, particularly this time of the year, going, uh, going into Christmas without having any sense, of in any sense of security about income for your household, sufficient money to pay for food, to pay for rent, to pay the mortgage, to look after your kids. These, these are the real issues that are being discussed around the kitchen table and house in this country, but instead we have this ideological battle within the government about whether in fact taxpayers' money should be used in any way to support this industry. Well, Madam Speaker, we should have seen this coming. We should have seen this coming because, of course, before the election they made it very clear they were going to rip one half a billion dollars out of the manufacturing sector, the automotive sector. That was the first thing we saw. The second thing we saw, of course, is the Treasurer's own comments. You know, obviously very weak on grain core, wanting to toughen up when it comes to this issue. Wants to toughen it up. You know, so what does he do? He effectively says, "Enough is enough. Enough is enough. We don't have to put any extra dollars in." Now let's look at the facts here. Of course, you should be very careful with taxpayers' money. Of course, you should. But let's look at the economic effects of investment. This is a company that employs directly and indirectly one quarter of a million Australians. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's about a nine-fold return for every dollar invested by taxpayers at the very least. In the case of this company, it could be argued it's up to 18 times higher as a result. So this is not just providing support for support's sake. This is ensuring that we provide su sufficient support uh, for that company. Madam Speaker, Unfortunately, the government has abjectly failed in that regard. Abjectly failed. We have had, time and time again, ministers on that side making it very clear they want to see an end to that support. Now, what are we to say to those workers? What are we to say to those workers, and indeed other workers who will be in other companies that would want to see their federal government provide support? for them in times of trouble. Now, we do all recall, Madam Speaker, that we had the Prime Minister, 
For the last four years, as opposition leader, go around the country visiting every workplace that, that, that would actually have him, talking about his concern for Australian workers. He was in the high-vis vests, as, as the member for Hunter says, he was in the high-vis vests, he was wearing the hard hat, he had the protective glasses on, he had Australian blue-collar workers standing behind him and he said he was going to be a Prime Minister that concerned himself for those people. He effectively used those workers as a prop, as a prop for his media conferences. Well, Madam Speaker, you've got to actually think a bit more about Australian workers than just using them as a backdrop for your political games. Australian workers expect their government to act in the national interest and indeed look after their back, look after them when they're in a bit of trouble. So what have we seen in that time? What we have seen, of course, is an inability an inability of this government to engage by the sector. We've had, we've had threats effectively by the, by, the, by the Treasurer, and we've had a Prime Minister, let's be honest, a Prime Minister who on one hand said he was going to have a calm and methodical government, then, he's, then he refers this issue to the Productivity Commission. But before the Productivity Commission can even start, the, the Prime Minister says, well, there'll be no more money for this industry. There's no more money to be had for this industry. Well, what sort of message does that send, send Holden and send the automotive sector when the Prime Minister had already made his decision and preempted the outcome of an inquiry by the Productivity Commission? It said, this is just a sham. We are referring this inquiry to the Productivity Commission as, a, as an alibi for doing nothing, as an alibi for not actually really caring about these workers. And today, unfortunately, most tragically, Madam Speaker, we will see thousands of workers lose their jobs. And that is a dreadful thing. That is a dreadful thing. Now, on top of that, you've seen, of course, we've seen the problems already uh, that confront Qantas. We would hope the government starts to engage more fully uh, with that company. Let's think, about, let's think about how important this automotive sector is to this country. We want to be a country that always is there to build things. We want to make sure we have a manufacturing sector. We are one of only 13 countries that have the capacity to design and manufacture a motor vehicle. We are, we are indeed an open and competitive market, but we also ensure that we provide the right support. And we are no different from other countries. The United States and other countries provide support for their auto workers. They look after them because they know it's a tough industry. They help them restructure. They innovate. They help them innovate. And what we have seen, of course, instead is the first thing, a reduction of $500 million from support from the government. And of course, then since then, we've seen every message that has been sent by this government to say we are no longer going to support those workers. Well, Madam Speaker, that is the problem here. We have a major problem with a government that has turned its back on Australian workers. Has turned its back on Australian workers. Now, Madam Speaker, the reason I sought to move a suspension of standing orders in this place was because you would have thought, on a day that this announcement was made, the acting Prime Minister would have got up on his feet and announced this to the Parliament right. and talked to the Australian people via this chamber. It took, a, it in fact, it took a question, I would Madam Speaker. That you are moving the motion and speaking to it the motion. It took a question, Madam Speaker. This goes to the genuineness of support that the government is showing towards these workers. It took a question from the Labor opposition to raise this matter in this place even though the acting Prime Minister was well aware of the facts when he entered the chamber in the first place. I mean, what sort of leader, what sort of government is this when the acting Prime Minister does not even stand up and make that obviously the biggest matter in this place? Now, interestingly, by, what, by way of contrast, even Premier Napthine understood the importance of, of standing up in the chamber and indeed announcing the dreadful and awful decision or the consequences of that decision in the chamber. But no, we saw none of that from the government. We saw none of that. And the first time they actually got up on their feet from their own side was at 2.30. 30. 30 minutes, the Treasurer, in response to a question. Prior to that, we had questions coming in from the back bench that had nothing to do with the automotive industry and nothing to do with Holden. I mean, that really pretty much underlines, underlines the insincerity that this government has 
when it comes to these people. Madam Speaker, so you can keep shouting, Madam, Madam Speaker, they can sh keep shouting all they like. They're, they sound overly defensive, Madam Speaker, overly defensive. And the reason why they sound defensive is because they've got something, they've got something to defend, and that is a dreadful reputation and a dreadful disregard for Australian workers. Let's remember they are the party of work choices. We should not forget. We should not forget. Oh yes, it's all a bit of a joke. Work choices is all a bit of a joke. But the fact is, the fact is, when it ever comes to workers, they're always put last by this government. When it, when it ever comes to workers, it always is that they come last. So why should it actually surprise me? Why should it surprise me or other members of the House in, on this side when it comes to the effects on working people in this country and the lack of regard that this government shows? Madam Speaker, this government needs to start to engage to look after companies in this country. It should continue to look at better ways to provide support to innovate sectors of our economy. It needs to start to engage not just with the automotive sector, Madam Speaker, but with the aviation sector and other sectors of our economy, instead of obsessing, instead of fighting amongst themselves about the issues that go to whether taxpayers should provide any support whatsoever. So as a lack of regard, as, as, as a result of the lack of regard and investment by this government and the fact that they've been divided ever since they were elected on this issue, we've seen them asleep, asleep on their watch, Madam Speaker. This government has been asleep. It's only been three months. It's hard to believe, only three months, but in fact they have failed to, to actually respond. Madam Speaker, today, as I say, Madam Speaker, today the Australian automotive industry is in crisis. Is in crisis. Around 250,000 Australians employed either directly or indirectly by that sector face, face a sleepless night. Australia's car industry and the workers and businesses <coughs> depended on and deserve more than a death by dithering. But that's what we've had from this government at best, Madam Speaker, at best. So, Mr Devereux, on behalf of Holden, of course, uh, was left, I think, left not clear on the government's position. At best, he was hoping they were making up their mind that they might provide some support. But I think uh, all doubt was lost when we, heard, when we heard the Treasurer yesterday make very clear he wanted to see the end of Holden in this place. He wanted to see the end of Holden in this company. So, unfortunately, the arm wrestle between the Minister for Industry and the Treasurer uh, was won by the Treasurer. An unfortunate thing, Madam Speaker, because as a result, those workers in, the, in that company and indeed other workers in similar companies will be facing a very uncertain Christmas. And that's a very unfortunate thing. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker you can interject all you like, uh, Member for Sturt. Here's a bloke from South Australia who has so little regard for Holden workers, he thinks it's funny. He thinks today's actual issues is funny. Well, Madam Speaker, it's not funny, and the members of the Sturt shouldn't think it's funny. I mean, what is the all about today? Today. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. The, member, the member will resume his seat. I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, the member for Gorton has routinely throughout his speech uh, tried to mislead people about the attitudes of the acting Prime Minister and now myself. The idea that I would find the, the leader, work the leader of the, the House will resume his seat. I've asked him to withdraw the statement that I found this funny, Madam Speaker, because I don't find it funny at all. The, the, member, the, member for the, leader, the Leader of the House will resume his seat. Uh, this is a, a debate. There will be the opportunity to refute those statements made by the member for Gorton in the course of the debate. But the member for Gorton will conclude his. Uh, thank you, one thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I, I'll, I'll finish where I started. This is a, a very sad day for Australia. Uh, such an iconic company um, that has, of course, employed Australians over many, many decades. Uh, a company that uh, most Australians grew up with, uh, and instead of seeing a way to ensure its future. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the government has been derelict in failing to support them when, they were, when, when it was needed. And as a result, as a result, that's why this motion needs to be debated today. That's why the opposition has brought this matter on, because when it comes to looking after industry and indeed workers in this country, you'll always find Labor standing up for them, Madam Speaker, and defending their interests and defending their interests and ensuring we find the best way possible to provide support 
uh, for, for those industries. That, of course, is the exact opposite that we've seen, but it shouldn't be that surprising. Everything this government said in opposition has been, of course, the complete opposite to what they have done when elected. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, enough of the confected anger from the other side. Thanks. Let's just go through some of the facts. Let's go through some of the facts. If I see that copy of the Financial Review up again, whoever holds it up is out under 94A. Let's deal with some of the facts. If the Labor Party thinks that something that was said in this House yesterday caused General Motors to suddenly decide, after being here for decades, that they should leave the country, then it just illustrates how poorly informed the Labor Party is about how enterprise works. These decisions are made over a matter of months, if not years, and it was a very significant decision for General Motors. And it was no secret. It was in the Wall Street Journal. It was well known to people that General Motors Holden was contemplating leaving Australia. And the confected anger from Labor is appalling. It is appalling because it treats the Australian people and stakeholders and workers with total contempt. Total contempt. In their statement in Detroit, the chief executive of General Motors Holden said emphatically the decision to end manufacturing in Australia reflects the perfect storm of negative influences the automotive industry faces in the country, including the sustained, including the sustained strength of the Australian dollar, high cost of production, small domestic market and arguably the most competitive and fragmented auto market in the world. That's what they said. That's what they said. The Labor Party, their hypocrisy knows no bounds. They were this morning railing against the high Australian dollar, and in the meantime they invite Paul Keating to come and address the caucus about how good it was to float the Australian dollar. Well, that's right, it was right to float the Australian dollar, and General Motors Holden identified it as one of the reasons why they are leaving Australia, the high Australian dollar. So please spare us the hypocrisy the from the Labor from Party. Melbourne Ports. Are you going to throw them out? Are you? The Melbourne, the Mel for Melbourne Ports, the mem member for Throsby and the member for Blacksland are all warned. Oh, the warned Treasurer already. has There's the a general warning. Australia's share of world car production has decreased, has decreased from 0.8 per cent of cars in 2000 to 0.32 per cent of cars in 2011. That's our share of world car production. So, so it virtually halved. In contrast, during that period, at the beginning of this century, uh, in Asian economies in the Middle East, car production has increased from 6 per cent of world production to 36 per cent of world production. So manufacturers, global manufacturers have moved to places of production where it is cheaper to produce a motor vehicle. And that was best evidence by Toyota's submission to the Productivity Commission inquiry that states by 2018 it needs to reduce the cost of producing each vehicle in Australia by $3,800. Holden has said it costs $3,750 per vehicle more to build cars in Australia relative to other countries such as Thailand. And of that $3,750, $2,000 of this is within Holden's own plans, and it mainly relates to the cost of labour. Another $1,500 is associated with their buy local program, and the final $250 is the cost of logistics for imported components. Now, the cost of production in Australia is no secret. Everyone knows it's been the case. It's been regularly stated by the manufacturers themselves. As it is no secret that the costs of production were proving to be so prohibitive. Oh, come on. The member for Macon will desist. The costs of production in Australia have inhibited our ability to compete on the world stage. Therefore, we must do everything we possibly can to try and reduce our costs of production without, without reducing the real wages of workers. And so, 
I say emphatically again in this place, as I did yesterday, to the workers at Toyota, please on Friday vote to support Toyota being in Australia. Please do that. Please do not listen to the AMWU, which is urging you to vote against a change in the work conditions at Toyota. If there is any lesson that must be learned, it is that you cannot push against the tide. You must work with the flow to get maximum benefit for Australian workers. That's what you've got to do. And now we have the union that is saying that it is appropriate for Toyota, which exports 70 per cent to the Middle East. They're saying it should close for 21 days over Christmas, when the Middle East needs that constant supply of Toyota motor vehicles. And it's not as if Toyota is saying no Christmas. They're coming back and saying 10 days. We want to close the plant just for 10 days, please, so that we can be a consistent supplier to the Middle East. And what about this clause in the agreement between Toyota and its workers? Currently, union representatives are entitled to 10 days paid education leave per year for the purpose of union sponsored training. 10 days. Union reps get 10 days pay for 10 days of sponsored training, and the union representatives are able to pull, to pull their collective days. So some senior union reps can take off months from work and be paid by Toyota. And Toyota is legitimately saying, we want to be able to allow our union representatives to take days off for union trading, but let's get the balance right. Let's get the balance right. And how do you explain in Tokyo that workers are entitled to have four hours paid leave for the purpose of donating blood? I mean, really, these are things, this is, this is the sort of stuff that sends the worst message overseas. And in Detroit, where there are workers, Detroit as a, as a capital city has just gone bankrupt. Detroit has gone bankrupt. General Motors has just lost billions of dollars. The American government has just lost nearly $10 billion on their investment in General Motors. General Motors is closing plants right around the world. And in Australia, the costs of production per vehicle are $3,750 higher than anywhere else. And why is it a surprise? They're not exporting. That's the problem. You don't get it. The member for the Melbourne export Ports market is not has fallen seat. apart for General Motors holding in Australia. And the Labor Party just doesn't get it. And as if there wasn't any warning, as if there wasn't any warning from General Motors executives, from Toyota executives, the OECD in a report compiled in 2012 said emphatically all the reasons that General Motors identified today was the reason why in 2012 the government at the time should work with the motor vehicle industry on the transition arrangements. This is not a surprise to Labor. They were warned by the OECD in 2012. And the former member for Lilly, the member for Lilly, the former Treasurer's Chief of Staff, was at the OECD as a Treasury representative at the time. And the warning was clear. If you do not deal with these transitional issues, there will not be a future for motor vehicle manufacturing in Australia. I say to you, Madam Speaker, of course we're upset about this. Of course we are. We, just, we, we hate the fact that Australians are losing jobs, and we want to do absolutely everything we can to stop that. When it came to the motor vehicle industry, we were the ones that said, you cannot put a new $1.8 billion tax on the motor vehicle industry. We were the ones that said, the best way to help manufacturing in Australia is to get rid of the carbon tax. We were the ones that said, we the were the ones that said that if you want to stimulate other industries like the mining industry, the worst thing you can do is impose a mining tax. And we're the ones that said you have to get rid of the regulation, you have to get rid of the red tape, you have to lower your costs of production in order to compete with the rest of the world. But the Labor Party doesn't get it. They've never run a business. Most of them have never worked in a business. All it is is pure politics from Labor, and the losers out of that are the workers, and the workers are the losers out of that 
because the Labor Party is more concerned about a political headline about, than they are about the worth of everyday workers. We are going to do everything we can for the workers, not just at General Motors Holden, but also to the workers at Toyota, to all of the component manufacturers' workers, and also to the taxpayers of Australia. Because ultimately, what it comes down to is prosperity only comes from hard work and enterprise. It doesn't come from the benevolence of taxpayers. Yeah. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Wakefield. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. In 1947, Joseph Benedict Chifley went to watch the first Holden leave the line at Fisherman's Bend. And the great question before this House is whether this Treasurer, Joseph Benedict Hockey, the member for North Sydney, is going to go watch the last Holden leave the line. The last Holden leave the line in my electorate. The last because this is a Treasurer. This is a treasurer with an iconic brand and 50,000 jobs hanging around his neck. Hanging around his neck. Make no mistake about it. And we all know the headline, even though we've been banned from showing anybody it. We all know the headline: "Hockey dares GM to go." Hockey de de dares GM to go. And there he was in this house, belligerence, shouting, bravado. All the same things we saw in this parliament, no doubt, were seen in the cabinet room. No doubt, was seen in the cabinet room. Because we all know, we all know, we all know that this came down to a fight between the member for North Sydney and the member for Groom. That was what this was all about. That was what this was all about. And I remember on the 3rd of October seeing seeing the ABC headlines after we toured the factory. The member for Hindmarsh toured the factory with us. He came down. He came down with the industry minister and we toured the factory. The Senator Xenophon, all the Liberal senators, Sean Edwards, Edwards was there and others. Big tour around Holdens. Pictures, minister, industry minister standing there proudly, using workers as props. And then he went and said, just have patience. In fact, I've got the headline here. In, new industry minister Ian McFarlane tours Holden and seeks patience from Detroit over federal assistance. That was the headline on ABC. That was the headline, seeking patience. And what they were trying to get was silence, silence from the Labor Party, silence from Senator Xenophon, silence from South Australia, silence from the unions, silence from the company. They were buying time. They were buying time to have an argument in cabinet, and it didn't come down. It didn't come down to these other factors. It came down to whether or not the treasurer, with all of his bravado and arrogance, prevailed over the member for Groom. That's what it came down to. That's why we had silence for so long. That's why we had silence for so long. Deathly silence, right up until, right up until the point there was a leak. Right up until the point was leaked. And what was the leak about? The leak was about shifting blame. About shifting blame onto a company that has been trying its level best and whose workforce has been trying its level best. Those opposite talk about labour costs and flexibility. What other workforce in this country during the GFC, during the global financial crisis, worked one week with pay and one week without? What other workforce? Only at Holdings, only at GMH, and when they were asked, and when they were asked, and when they were asked to give up hard-won entitlements, when they were asked to do that to secure production, when they were asked for $15 million in costs, what did the workforce do? They voted to agree with the company, setting setting up the setting up the framework for future investment. What they needed, what they needed to remain in Australia was government assistance, the same government assistance that car workers get in Germany and in, and in Japan and in the US and in Korea and in any other country, in any other country that supports its car workers. But in Australia, in Australia they found a government that was indifferent to the economic circumstances of the world and indifferent to jobs in this country. Let's make no mistake. Let's make no mistake. This was all about the division in the government. This was all about the heart and soul of this government. And what we find is that a callous, 
flint-hearted treasurer has won the day. And if there is unemployment in this country, and if there is a tragic human cost to this decision in this country, it will be on the treasurer. It will be on the member for Hindmarsh. It will be on Senator Edwards and all of the other Liberals who sat quiet, who sat quiet, while for two months, sat quiet for two months, sat quiet for two months, lulling the whole place into silence. And then, at the five minutes to midnight, at five minutes to midnight, they leap on this iconic national brand. This iconic national grant. And for 50 years, for 50 years, governments have been supporting car manufacturing in this country. 50 odd years. And that's why yesterday we had uh, the, the Minister Hoggett from uh, the Victorian government say, My message is to my federal colleague is that any speculation on the future of Holden is not helpful. It's disappointing. And what response do they get? A treasurer, an acting Prime Minister, goading this company to make a decision before Christmas of all times. Goading them. We had the acting Prime Minister send a letter. I mean, who sends letters any day? Couldn't pick up the phone? Couldn't, couldn't pick up the phone? Couldn't go down and have a meeting? I mean, what we had is federal industry policy descend to a one-page one page excuse. That was what federal industry policy became—a one-page excuse. A one-page excuse. Now, there are workers in my electorate, and I was with them last week. Murray Akehurst, Murray Akehurst in the Advertiser on the, the 2nd of the 12th, talking about how he wanted to fight for his jobs. Been there 16 years. He's 50 years old. Where is he going to get a job? Where is he going to get a job? And Damien Griffiths of Andrews Farm, a father of two, or two children, well, he's got a mortgage. Where will he get a job? Where will he get a job? Where will he get a job? Well, I tell you, the human cost, the human cost, the human cost will still be there in 2017. Make no mistake, it will be there in no uncertain terms. And all that this government has given, all that this government has given the workers of Holdings, the certainty they've given them is a certainty of unemployment. That's what they've given him. That's what they've given him. What we have is a treasurer who's forsaken his namesake. Make no doubt about it. And he won't have the courage. He won't have the courage to get to go down there in Elizabeth and watch the last car roll off the line. He won't have the courage to go down there and face those workers. None of you had. And when and when component workers came up to this to this house, where did they get a minute, meeting? They got a meeting with the industry minister, who's a good man, who's trying his best, I'm sure. But they couldn't get a meeting. They couldn't get a meeting with the treasurer. They couldn't get a meeting with the treasurer. So you can be sure. You can be sure what we have. What we have is a government that is completely indifferent. Completely indifferent to these workers. But the other headline, and I know we're not allowed to hold up headlines, but we should remember this headline. The other headline the today. Member, PM's pansies. The member is defying the, the chair. He will remove oh, himself well, at once. Well, I'll take once. the day. Oh. I'm the You name me. Name me. I'll take the day's pay in solidarity with the workers the that hold me. The member, you name me. The name member me. will not defy the chair. He will remove name himself forthwith under 94A. Remove yourself. I call the Leader of the House. The member has behaved deplorably. He will remove himself at once from the chamber under 94A. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, and I rise to speak on the motion uh, moved by the member for Gorton uh, that this House condemns the Abbott government for its failure to protect Australian jobs in the automotive and manufacturing sector. And I move an amendment to that, uh, that all words after that be admitted and the following words substituted. That this parliament pledges to work together to protect and support manufacturing and employment in Australia through policies that promote growth particularly taxation and regulatory policies. The member for Linkia, Madam Speaker, this issue, the member for Throsby. This issue is far too important for the political game playing that we are seeing from our Labor colleagues in the chamber today. And so the amendment that I move to the motion moved by the member for Gorton is to try and rise the parliament. There will be quite a 
the minister will resume his seat. The raucous members on my right will also desist. I call the minister. Madam Speaker, the voters in South Australia, the people in South Australia and Victoria, and the Holden workers in both Melbourne and Adelaide aren't really interested in the political game playing by the opposition on this issue today. They are sitting in their homes and workplaces thinking that by 2017, at the latest, they will have had to find new careers and new jobs to feed their families. And the amendment that I move to this motion today reflects the fact that this parliament should rise above the petty point scoring that we are seeing from the opposition on this issue. Because there are hundreds of thousands of people in the manufacturing sector around Australia, not just the car workers, there are hundreds of thousands of families, workers, small business people, whether it's in the component industry or other manufacturing, that are all affected by exactly the same issues that have impacted on Holden in their announcement today. Nobody seriously believes, do they, that uh, Holden is the only company in Australia that is affected by the high Australian dollar, high production costs, high real wages. And that is what was reflected in the statement that General Motors made in their own press statement from Detroit. They didn't seek to blame the federal government or the state government or anybody else for what's happened to Holden. The member for McEwen. They very pointedly, clearly and factually set out why this commercial business decision was made in Detroit, probably in the last few months, but communicated today. And they said in their statement, the decision to end manufacturing in Australia reflects the perfect storm of negative influences the automotive industry faces in the country, including the sustained strength of the Australian dollar, the high cost of production, small domestic market and arguably the most competitive and fragmented auto market in the world. So General Motors themselves made it perfectly plain, the Minister Madam Speaker. His seat. They're Just still the playing the games. It's pathetic. The member for Greenville, is he on a point of order? Yeah, yes, Madam Speaker. What is the point of My order? My point of order goes to uh, whether the amendment moved by the Manager of Opposition Business is in order. It is. The, the Leader of the House. It is in order. It is in order. It, is, is in order it is in because order. It, it contradicts the original motion that is before the House. The, the amendment is in order. I call the Minister. Madam Speaker, as a South Australian, I'm not the only South Australian in the House, we understand how important the car industry has been. And for years, people like myself, the member for Hindmarsh, the member for Boothby, senators from South Australia have, have campaigned and argued for the car industry. And money from the taxpayer is not the reason General Motors Holden have made this decision today. Exactly right. There has been a billion dollars spent to 2015 from the Australian taxpayer, a billion dollars of taxpayers' funds to support the, the minister car industry his seat. to 2015. The member for Grandler on a point of order. Point of order, Madam Speaker, uh, uh, goes to your ruling. The motion is about automotive. Uh, the amendment, the amendment move does not mention automotive or the, the car industry. The, not once. The standing not order. Not once does it mention the it. And therefore, the member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. The standing orders per permit such an amendment to be moved. The minister has the call. Thank you, Thank you Madam Speaker. And of course, manufacturing is the car industry, so of course it is a relevant amendment to the original motion. And beyond 2015, a billion dollars sits on the table for the car industry. So taxpayers' money is not the problem. If taxpayers' money was the problem, Madam Speaker, why is it that when the previous Prime Minister, Ms Gillard, announced a $275 million package for the car industry in March 2012, and heralded it by saying, through the announcement that we've made together today, we know Holden will be here through to 22. Why is it that with that $275 million, six months later, Holden announced that they were reducing their workforce by 8 per cent? This is in spite of the fact that the Premier of South Australia, Mr Wetherill, said, we are, what we're guaranteeing is no job decline. He said that in the paper on the 24th of March 2012. And then, six months later, Holden reduced their workforce by 8 per cent. 
and all fair-minded people in this place and in the community know that there has been a tremendous amount of taxpayer money put into the car industry over decades, not just, the last, not just since the Howard government's automotive plan. And General Motors has made it absolutely clear today that the reasons they are closing their operations has got nothing to do with the decisions the federal government made. And Labor can spin their wheels and try their best to go out and pretend to the, to the Holden workers this has got something to do with the federal government. They will find it very hard to explain how, if it's our fault that Holden is closing their operations, it wasn't their fault that Ford closed their operations, or it wasn't their fault that Mitsubishi closed their operations, or it wasn't their fault that the Olympic Dam expansion is not going ahead. They will find it very hard to explain why they thought support for the car industry was a fringe benefits tax changes that hit the car industry with $1.8 billion of extra tax. They will find it very hard to explain to the people of my great state why it is that a carbon tax that added to the cost of building a car didn't have any impact on the car industry, didn't have any impact apparently on the car industry, because their hypocrisy is writ large in this debate, Madam Speaker. The sanctimony coming from the Labor Party is gut-wrenching, because this is beyond politics. I see the member for Kennedy here. He's been arguing for years for policies for the car industry and other industries that we probably don't support. But at least he's been genuine from the beginning. I didn't hear these howls of outrage and condemnation of their own government when Ford announced that they were closing, or Mitsubishi when they were closing. I don't remember the South Australian members of parliament standing up here and criticising the previous government when BHP said that sovereign risk, uncertain government policy, extra taxes and the demands of the union movement have been the reason that the Olympic Dam expansion was not going ahead. And the public are not stupid. The public know full well what has been going on here in manufacturing in Australia. It is in the statement made by General Motors Holden. And I ask the question, Madam Speaker, as a South Australian, what has my state government done in the last 12 years to diversify our state's economy? Why haven't they been putting resources into agriculture? or education services, or construction, or the mining industry? Why didn't they diversify our economy rather than relying on more and more taxpayers' dollars to keep a car industry here that has said today the taxpayer dollars weren't the reason they were staying in the first place and the taxpayers' dollars wouldn't keep them here? Even if the Abbott government had announced another half a billion dollars for the car industry on top of the billion that's already on the table, would it have kept the car industry here? It is very unlikely that it would have, Madam Speaker, because the decisions about this were made in Detroit. It was Detroit's decision not to allow Holden to export. There was a time a few years ago, Madam Speaker, when Holden was exporting to the United States that when you went to California you'd get into a police car, well hopefully not get into a police car, but if you saw a police car, it was made by Holden and Elizabeth. They were exporting to the Middle East, Madam Speaker, one of their biggest export destinations. And then Detroit made the decision that Holden should not compete with their own operations in America by exporting to the United States and the Middle East. It was, Holden's deci it was, it was Detroit's decision not to reinvest in, in their equipment at Holden and Elizabeth to make the plant more and more competitive. And the reason the House is basically quiet, Madam Speaker, is because everybody knows this is true. So all the political point scoring in the world, all the conflicted outrage in the world, won't Member change the fact that what I'm saying are known facts. I mourn what Holden has announced today, but unfortunately we have to work together to make it better for the future. The original question was that the motion be agreed to. To this, the member for the Minister for Education has moved an amendment. I am scrating the question. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. I call the member for Kennedy. Madam Speaker, um, I wrote a small history book. Uh, this is serious stuff. I, I, don't think, I, don't think, I don't think really this is time for laughing and humour. Right? Madam, Speaker, Madam Speaker, you cannot write a history of Australia without putting in that history the story of Holden. It is one of the great achievements of the Australian people. 
the story of the Holden family and Lawrence Hartman, Madam Acting Speaker. And you're watching that great part of Australian history, that, that great achievement in Australian people, cease today. Madam Speaker, myself and others, almost exclusively from the crossbench, Madam Speaker, have risen in this place again and again and spoken about the value of the dollar. And really, you shouldn't come into this place if you don't understand about the value of the dollar. You really shouldn't be here. Now, Paul Keating, Paul Keating did the right thing. He allowed the dollar to float initially, and it went down to 49 cents. That was the true value of the Australian dollar, 49 cents. And then he drove it up. Just please listen. Please listen. You might learn something. Then he drove it up through the roof. Peter Costello came in and again he did the right thing and he allowed the dollar to free float and it went down to 52 cents. And then for reasons similar to Keating, best known to himself or the Reserve Bank, he drove it up over 92 cents. Now, I mean, please, if you allow the dollar to free float, then that is where it will go to. And Madam Acting Speaker, I have asked for a picture and I just haven't got it here, but it's a picture of me filling up a car in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And the car is an Australian motor car. And I said, uh, is all your fleet Australian motor cars? And he said, yes. The Holden motor car, Caprice, is an excellent car. And he said, I've always had Holden Caprices, but I will not be buying it next year. And I said, why? He said, because your dollar has doubled in value. And that means that in terms of Australian money, he said, I was paying $36,000. Now I'm paying $72,000. So I'm going to buy the Brazilian car which is $37,000. I don't think it's quite as good, but I can't afford to pay $72,000. Now, that is, what, that is what the manager of Holden said today. But, I mean, if your interest rates, Madam Speaker, are 2.7 per cent, a three-year average last time I looked, 2.7 per cent, and the rest of the world is an average of 0.2 per cent. Madam Speaker, it not only says to the world, put your money here in Australia, buy Australian dollars, because you'll get a lot better interest rate, but it also says to the rest of the world that we have a policy of a high dollar, which will continue. Madam Speaker. But if that dollar comes down to where it, all I'm saying is that's where it went when it was allowed to free float. Both those men. Um, allowed it to free float and it went down to 50 cents. So I mean, if it's allowed to free float today, when our economy is much, much narrower, and uh, I hold up for the uh, edification of the House uh, that picture of me filling up an old motor car in, in Sao Paulo, a matter of acting speaker. But, but if that dollar is allowed to free float, and God bless people in the uh, uh, leading economists in this country, and uh, David Koch, who was on that uh, uh, morning program, he and uh, Ross Garner, who I disagree with violently on many things, but leading business people throughout this country have said you must bring the dollar down. I mean, there's no way that industry, uh, Mike Cattleman, I mean, yes, we would have done incredible damage with, with the ban on live cattle to Indonesia. But, Madam Acting Speaker, we were already in trouble before that. We simply cannot live with the dollar. Effectively, our incomes in the cattle industry, in the wheat industry, and at Holden, their incomes have dropped in half because the dollar went down. You don't have a problem with wages if the dollar drops in half. When people on my left, they talk all the time about you know wages being too high. Well, you know, let them set a good example. I would suggest, Madam Speaker, but. But, but what, I, I don't want to make cheap shots. I take that back, Madam Speaker. I want to, want to say to you that you will live in a country without the ability to build a motor vehicle. And I sit under a picture of one of the greatest ever Australians, Jack McEwen. And Jack McEwen said, the third reason for having tariffs is that I will never see my country in another war without the ability to build a main battle tank. Well, I mean, I don't know. Well, <clears throat> um, Madam Speaker, 
The immediate solution to this problem, uh, and our, our little tiny party has been screaming this for ages, is that if every car bought under a government contract in Australia, which is 25 per cent of the cars in Australia, if every one of those cars is an Australian motor car, then, and it's very easy, Madam Speaker, because the Americans have already done it in the steel industry. George Bush moved the, the, the legislation and it was carried through by Barack Obama. And both of them said if it contains one dollar of government money, then it will contain 100 per cent of American steel. And, Madam Speaker, the Americans are attacking the Chinese for artificially holding their currency down. And they are. You can use the word artificial if you like. But they're holding their currency down, no doubt about that. Madam Speaker, the Chinese have accused the Americans of holding their currency down. And they are, no doubt. Madam Speaker, no one will ever accuse this country of holding its dollar down. Because we have actually pushed it up through the roof. And one of the greatest damages done in this place. And uh, I like Peter Costello personally, Madam Speaker. One of the greatest damages was he skited in this place continuously that a high dollar was an indication of the success of the government. I mean, Madam Speaker, really that sort of comment demonstrates the complete opposite. But I'm not here. I don't want to denigrate he or anyone else today. I mean, I agree with the proposition, the amendment being pushed forward. To be quite frank with you, even though I, I, I agree also with the opposition that action should be taken here. But, Madam Speaker, let me say to you that when the Reserve Bank said, I am reducing the interest rates in addressing the issue of the value of the dollar, when they put that magic combination together, the dollar went down 20 cents. So you know where the answers are, Madam Speaker. You know where it is. The eminent economists in this country, and David Koch, for all of his humour and lightweightness on his program in the mornings that we all love, you know, is also a very eminent economist. And, and he put the proposition forward with great aggression, as did his wife, as did Ross Garner, as did some of the leading, many of the leading business figures in this country. But I've got mines closing, um, 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 Madam Speaker. I have cattlemen, you know, very sadly shooting themselves at the rate of one every five weeks now, Madam Speaker. But the, the value of that dollar, there's a fellow here questioning that, Madam Speaker. I'll give you the name of one of them, Jimmy Whalen. You can look it up. His son committed suicide nine weeks ago, and you're, you're laughing at it. You seem to think it's funny. You seem to think we're making a political, political statement the about the it, Madam Speaker. That remark. Madam Speaker. Yeah. If, if there was, if there was remember, criticism there, Madam remember, Speaker, we'll I withdraw it because I do want to state as, as far as humanly possible, positive here. But, but the situation. If you represent a country electorate and you don't know the pain that's going on there, then I don't think you do represent a country electorate, Madam Speaker. But, 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 but if that dollar drops in half, then the income for all of those people, the grain growers, the dairymen, the cattlemen and the, and the workers and the workers in the motor vehicle industry in Australia, their incomes, at least for their company and their industry, will double, Madam Speaker. So you know where the answers lie. The immediate answer is to use the government contracts to restrict them to purchasing Australian motor cars. As I understand it, the Catholic schools, for example, in Queensland, their cars are bought under a government contract. And I am told that 25 per cent of the cars in Australia are bought under government contracts. So the answer lies with the government, Madam Speaker. And I plead on behalf of every single Australian to rescue an industry and not see our country left without the ability to make an electric motor, a tyre and now a motor car, Madam Speaker. I mean, what technology will we be left with in this country if we continue to pursue a policy if it's not the government's responsibility, it's got nothing to do with us, Madam Speaker? It most certainly has, and the answers are there, and I've described them today. They do not come from me. They come from the most eminent economists in this country, Madam Speaker, and I plead with the, the government to look at those solutions. Expired. The original question was that the motion be agreed to, to which the Honourable Leader of the House has moved as an amendment, that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Is the division required?
Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I reappoint the members for Wright, Parks and Dawson as tellers for the eyes, and the members for Fowler, Shortland and Lawler tellers for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 88, noes 49. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the Acting Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I move that further questions be placed on the notice paper and, as promised during question time, I table the Government's Statement of Ministerial Standards. Uh, this document will be made available on the website of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. <laughs>